and welcome to Epic Fantasy Book Club Podcast, or The Hobbit Book Club Podcast. I'm Joe, here with me is my co-host Dan. Hello and greetings. And welcome to all the men and women of the West. Now, uh, last time we did chapter 6 through to 7, to eight, up to 8. Now we're at number 8. And apparently in Mirkwood, there's some sort of magical darkness. I'm just saying, it seems to be the case. Um, we also find out in this chapter, on page 166 of my edition, that I have here, uh, Bilbo has the sharpest eyes of the team, as he's the one who principally is able to spot the uh, boat at the inner end of the lake. Same with Philly, and I'd argue it would have been consistent that Balin could see it, because he's always the, the watch. Mm-hmm. It's either he's got some of the best eyes or he's the most careful observer. Uh, maybe he's like Kira Barros and expects the unexpected. I'm kidding. That's it for card captor nods. Uh, Dory's also the strongest. We find out on the same page of that. We find out Bilbo has the sharpest eyes. So that's why Dory was always the one tasked with carrying Bilbo. It's, you're the buffest guy here. You carry him. And you know what? Like, contribute here. Um, mm. but Dory's also really, really competent. From what I yeah. Say. He's just a whiner, like, uh, Bilbo. Although I'm not going to blame him too much, because a lot of these adventures are rather, um, uncomfortable. I'm just saying. Um, now the first, uh, of the, uh, those to cross are Thorin and Bilbo on page 168. And, of course, Bomber falls into the water. Freaking Bomber. Always dragging the team down. Sometimes literally. Just because of how fat he is. Yeah, it's like... Oh, come on, man. And they all, the rest of the dwarves waste all their arrows on page 170. On the same page that Bomber falls into the lake. So the others basically roll their nat ones for intelligence rolls. To just start firing off into the darkness when Thor and his time. No, don't. No, you idiots. I feel like the only ones, if this was a D&D camping, who actually are experienced players are Bilbo, Gandalf, and Thor. Mm-hmm. And, and that the rest are just basically just... Boobs? Yes. They're the Monty Python uh, mean crew. Yeah. Of players. Uh, now, Bilbo is also forced into climbing up a tree to look out over uh, Mirkwood. And, of course, we get Bomber who wakes up, unfortunately, on page 174 to 175. And he immediately counsels the team into leaving the path. Because he forgot everything ex uh, that came after leaving Bilbo's place. And stupidly says, well, guys, what's the worst that could happen? Well, you forgot your entire adventure. Eh, it was probably not worth remembering. Anyways, we're leaving the path, guys. Think of the food. <laughs> Think of your faith against that tree. Yeah, I know. And we get some of the creepiest monsters in The Hobbit. I find these things creepier than Smaug. I hated them at 11 years old. I think I think this novel is why I hate spiders by nature. And I just despise them. But I really hate spiders. They take care of bugs. Yes, but they're also a pain in the ass themselves. You know what also takes care of bugs? And that are really cool. Bats. As well as frogs. I like frogs and bats, but I hate spiders. I hate mosquitoes. I hate all bugs. I have no use for them. They're just there to annoy us. What about honey? Okay, I'll, I'll admit, I actually like bees. Never mind. I have a soft spot in my heart for bees. Bees are cool. and Because they're the only bugs that won't sting you out of hand. They'll just leave you alone. Apparently, Tolkien didn't like spiders either. So there's a special kind of demon in his world. But, well, as seen in the Silmarillion with Ungolion, uh, who ends up devouring the two trees of light uh, and leaving unlight and darkness in her wake. And she actually tries to kill uh, Morgoth, but is chased off with by his uh, Balrogs. She then meets up with other spiders in the south, mates with them, eats them, after mating with him. And uh, she has a whole slew of children. 
such as Shelob, before she eats herself in her hunger. Well, <laughs> that was fun. Yeah, now these things are probably great great grandchildren or so of hers, as they seem to be, as they are giant spiders. Mm hmm. Um, and they're wholly evil and, well, they're cannibalistic man eaters. Yeah. So, who needs them? Of course, the dwarf. Bilbo does a great job against them, as do the dwarves in general. The dwarves do pretty good considering they're sick from their toxins. They fight them off like champs. And they get quite a few badass moments. Uh, you also have uh, Bilbo who, who sings rather uh, funny songs. Let me try to find the songs. Uh, I have to skim through the book. I uh, really like the songs he sings. I didn't mark it down. I should have. All right. Old fat spider spinning in a tree. Old fat spider can't see me. Adercrop, Adercrop, won't you stop? Stop your spinning and look for me. Old Tom Nutty, all big body. Old Tom Nutty can't spy me. Adercrop, Adercrop, down you drop. You'll never catch up your tree. Very, very playful. And very juvenile. Yes. That's why I love that song. It's essentially the... Uh, can't to nah, to nah, 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 nah. Exactly. The Tolkien... Uh, Verbose way of saying, nah, 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 you can't catch me. Yeah. And, oh man, I really love how he taunts them. He has no respect for those filthy, disgusting pieces of, well, anyways. Um, hey, if they were, the cool bug eaters are the bats and the frogs. Like I said, I have a soft spot in my heart for bats. Mm -hmm. Well, we've lived on property with a lot of bats and it meant no bugs. That's why I love them. They're one of my favorite animals out there. Maybe we should do an a favorite animal podcast sometime just for fun. <laughs> and anyway, least favorite at some point. Anyways, uh, Tolkien knows what's what. So uh, they fight them off. And then on page 193, Bilbo recounts the story of how he uh, encountered Gollum. But here's the thing. His version's apparently skewed. Mm -hmm. And there are details that he lied about. And the version he told the dwarves is the same version he told uh, Gandalf, uh, Frodo, and Sam. And as Gandalf says later, the uh, version that, yes, Go Gandalf heard Gollum's version, which was also fairly untrue. But the thing is, even reconciling the two, Gandalf found that both of them left, like, both of them were liars about this story. And that there are details that he didn't that were quite wrong and completely untrue at a few points, and that Gandalf just made him kind of cast a suspicious eye on both when it comes to the story, their riddle battle and whatnot. So we get a lot of world building there, yet and character lore there. Even if it like even if we can't trust what either of them say, we can trust that in general, something, there was a clash between the two for the ring. And what we could also count on is apparently Bilbo had Golem at his mercy, but he showed pity. He didn't want to kill Golem. And that the ring was urging Bilbo to kill Golem, and Bilbo couldn't do it. And that the ring has cast a spell on both, where both of them are lying about what happened. And both of them desire the ring above all other things. So there's a lot of lore there. Mm -hmm. And I really love that. It's Tolkien's uh, master craft storytelling at its finest. Yeah, because there's a reason why uh, why uh, Golem couldn't die right then and there. Yeah, because you like you got to bear in mind, like in Lord of the Rings, in the first few chapters, you have... Yeah, Frodo asks, like, okay, so he had the ring on his finger. He had Sting in his hand. Why didn't he just, you know, like, finish Golem? And, uh, get him. Well, that's apparently something that Bilbo didn't mention, that he actually had Golem pretty much begging for his life at one point, or something along those lines, and he just couldn't do it. He pitied Golem. And Frodo, but Golem wanted to eat him. Yeah, well, pity stayed Bilbo's hand. And pity, pity is what stayed Golem... Uh, Bilbo's hand also, I think, towards the orcs. Because Bilbo's not a murderer. He's a good person. Mm -hmm. And this is where Frodo and Sam do kind of ask them, why don't you trust his version of the story? There's just too many holes in it. 
And that ring, you know, like Gandalf is just going, that ring, I really don't trust him. So you get a lot of lore there, and like the narration, you can't trust. So if you can't trust the narration, now here's the thing Jane Austen and other authors use this kind of technique, but not. But here's the thing. You're supposed to discern these holes in them and Dostoevsky's novels and whatnot and uh, Conrad. But the thing is, they never fully made it obvious. Mm -hmm. Tolkien decided that it should kind of be obvious in Lord of the Rings. But this is where he's using retroactive continuity and whatnot and the meta narration uh, n nature of his novels. And... He's doing it better, I find. But he's also yeah. allowing you to know the truth. Because I always want to know the truth of what happened in The Hobbit. Yes. I, I love the truth. It's a virtue that is too often disregarded. And the whole, well, does it really matter? Thing that a lot of those 19th century novelists didn't, like that kind of philosophy of theirs, I just don't agree with. And I'm glad Tolkien agrees with us that the truth does matter. Mm -hmm. And the truth should come out. Now, that said, let's continue. Uh, now, we get on page 194. No, wait. Um, uh, hold on. I know it's around here somewhere. Oh, yeah. Page 193. I loved Wala. Open an eye and looked around at them. Where's Thorin? <laughs> I had completely forgotten about Thorin up to that point. Yes. You also, right? I think that was what Tolkien intended. Like, oh, 13 dwarves, and you don't give it any... You're like, well, 12 dwarves and Bilbo. You don't give it any thought till the scene with Dwalin where he says, where's Thorn? And you go, oh, right, Bilbo led the team, not Thor. Oh, crap, where's Thor? And I hope he wasn't eaten. Um, but then he's out of the frying pan into the fire in some ways. Yeah. And as you get the dwarves, uh, he's the first of the dwarves to be captured by the uh, elves and these elves are not the uh, you gotta bear in mind in some ways they've become uh, darker in nature from Thingol's period now once you read the Silmarillion you'll kind of understand why they don't like dwarves mm -hmm. but on the other hand Thingol did uh, stint on the payments to a, from a certain point of view but that said he didn't overall like it's complicated the dwarves wanted Naglamir as their prize uh, because that was the actual pendant, and what uh, Thingol wanted to do was take a silver and put it in the most beautiful pendant or uh, necklace ever crafted by the dwarves. So he hired a bunch of dwarves with all the gold and silver they could ask for to put the uh, silver rail into the Navalami. They did this, then he said, "All right, now it's ours." And he said, "Whoa, no, I like what? I commissioned you guys." Oh yeah, but the Navalami is ours. And at which point he told them, no, it's mine because it was given to me. And so is the Soma realm. Now, you know, basically it was a gift from my son-in-law. You're not taking it. And my daughter, you're not taking these from me. You're taking over my dead body. Okay. Wait, what? <laughs> they slew him. At which point most of the dwarves were slain by the guards who came down to find Thingol dead. Cause they kind of, and they kind of went, Hey, that was our King. You jerk. At which point you pretty much have the dwarves. Oh, crap. <laughs> I would, and then they were some of the survivors reported back to the other dwarves, hey, by the way, uh, they have a summer realm, and they totally skimped out on a paying us. So you then have a dwarf versus uh, forest elf war. And you have the Fanorians coming in, saying, wait, the summer realm's ours. So is the Naglamir. And so you have a three-way war. Yeah. All because of some dwarves. Now that's revealed on page 194. Now here's the thing. That entire like piece of lore... I, is one of my favorite parts of the Silmarillion. But here's the... In reading it, I, I geeked out over that part. But as well as the reference to the Light Elves, uh, the Deep Elves, I think which would be, I think, the uh, Noldor, and the Sea Elves, the Teleri. Hmm. So... Oh, and uh, the Vanyar are the Light Elves. Well, a lot more of it. And you have the Wood Elves, of course. Yeah. I forget their ter the term for them. I, I should remember it, but I forgot temporarily. In the heat of the moment. Now, uh, that said, here's the thing. the uh, We get the whole story here of pretty much the history of the dwarves and the wood elves 
uh, in one page. And I'm sorry, but that's that's amazing because I could it's very fascinating. It's taken me, I think, three minutes to summarize the entire story, and Tolkien does it in less time. That's just that's a mastercraft writer. Sorry, I, I admire him. Um, now let me just try to find the the part in the page. Uh, oh yeah, no, it was one ninety five. Now, the Elf King had bargained with them to shape his raw gold and silver. Now, we get the Dwarven version, and had afterwards refused to give them their pay. It wasn't actually raw gold and silver. It was a Silmaril and a Nadlamir, both the property of the Wood Elves. Mm -hmm. So, you actually have here Thorin's version, which is a lie. It was not raw gold and silver. So, the version the Dwarves are telling isn't, re isn't true. That said, Thorin's family had had nothing to do with the old Quero. So he had nothing to do with it, but he also has a biased version of what happened. Mm -hmm. Which is interesting, because you already see that both sides have kind of already made up their mind about each other. Yeah. And that's how prejudice kind of works. And But that said, Thranduil... Now, I like him as a character, but I find that as a... But... Because the thing is, Thorin basically just says, like... You know, like... Uh, he's asked, why did you and your folk tr three times try to attack my people at their merrymaking? And Thorin explains, we did not attack them. We came to beg. We were starving. Yeah. Where are your friends now and what are they doing? I don't know, but I expect sp starving in the forest. What were you doing in the forest? Looking for food and drink because we were starving. But what brought you into the forest at all? Now, Thorin shut his mouth. There. Now, the problem is Thranduil... I'll say this, is greedy. Now, Thingol by nature was not greedy. Now, he was possessed by the Silmaril to an extent, but before that, Thingol was a really great king and a great god. Thranduil has fallen way, way for far. Like, the apple fell so far from the uh, proverbial tree, it's not even funny. But it's mm -hmm. been several generations, I think. Yeah, he's more of a, he's more of a brigand. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Um, well, he's a Baron Lord. But on the other hand, once you read the history, you can kind of understand why he's got some of the opinions and attitudes he has. Mm -hmm. But he's not as welcoming as Elrond towards others. Yeah. Elrond generally takes the attitude, you're welcome in my lands until you prove otherwise. Mm-hmm. Thank heavens for Legolas. Uh, as for... Bilbo, he ends up surviving for a few weeks in the castle, stealing food to survive, uh, living like a thief. And we actually get a bit of lore, actually. Now that I think about it, I love this bit on page 199. Uh, that the chair of the uh, Elven King is carved from uh, wood. On his head was a crown of berries and red leaves. And this is what he wears in the autumn. And in the spring, he wears a crown of woodland flowers. And in his hand, he always holds a carven staff of oak. Now, what's interesting here is that the Hittite kings, I think, held a crook. Mm -hmm. Like a shepherd's crook. And that's what it reminds me of. Yeah. And it's very fascinating because oak, I think, represents longevity. And and oaks are also symbols of wisdom. Uh, well, knowledge, I should say. When I say wisdom, I mean like. Wisdom in the Norse sense. Lots of knowledge. Uh, strength, morale, resistance, as well as... Uh, uh, they're often associated with honor, nobility, and whatnot. Mm-hmm. And that's interesting because the Randwil is of noble birth. Yeah. Now, he later ends up showing... Well, he gets character development. Uh, sure, he wants his... Uh, slice of the pie later of the dragon treasure despite having no claim to it uh he just says dibs essentially mm -hmm. like, but the thing is well dibs itself is a sacred uh is a sacred uh tradition so i guess he has the best claim if he says dibs yeah dib. the problem mm -hmm. isn't how he words it yeah now he's greedy but he does overcome his greed later when, thanks mm -hmm. to Gandalf and Bilbo. So, well, he learns. So, 
at the beginning of the story, I don't have the highest opinion, but I guess my opinion improves as the story goes on. Mm -hmm. And I'm just biased because I really like Bilbo and his crew. Yeah. But that said, Thranduil does have his good side. I mean, he's a great dad. Like, his son Legolas is a great guy. Mm. So he raised his son to be very open-minded and warm-hearted by nature. So, like, just because he's got his shady side doesn't mean he's a terrible father. He's a complex character. Mm-hmm. He's... There's so much that's interesting about him. And apparently uh, the finest wine in the area is, well, almost in the world of Middle-earth, is Darwinian wine, uh, which is reserved for the king's table, but his butler and his chief guard are kind of... Um, they want to nip. Because <laughs> that alcohol is meant to... In, to be in a wine glass and flip, not in a huge flagon to drink. Yeah, like but they're not, rum. To, they're not supposed to drink it. I know. And they kind of let the dwarves slip out. That said, uh, that said, like I said, uh, Thranduil may start as an antagonist, but he becomes a protagonist later. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Uh, and of course, the way they escape from the elves on page 213 to 216 is really cool. Yeah. And, no offense, the, the elves kind of lower their guard. Foolishly. But the thing is, they didn't expect... Like, they didn't know Bilbo was running around. Yeah, so it's hard to blame them. Like, yeah. they didn't do anything exactly wrong. They're, and you know what? At the end of the book, they do rally an army. And when Gandalf and Bilbo pretty much say, uh, yeah, uh, there are orcs coming, their reaction is... Okay, maybe we should make peace with the dwarves. Sorry about that whole uh, nasty business in Mirkwood and over the gold. Can we just deal with the orcs first, and then we'll uh, then Has we'll thing. talk. We'll talk. Like Thranduil is one of the first ones to say, "Let's talk." Mm -hmm. Shop later. Now, the thing is, I, I give that a lot of credit, and he does act as a mediator. So we've bashed him a little, but let's defend him. On the other hand, so that's the thing with a Tolkien character. With any character in Middle Earth, they're not clear cut. Mm -hmm. They're complex, and a lot of them do get redemption arcs or fall from grace arcs. So, and you have to bear in mind that uh, Thranduil is like uh, Theoden, uh, the Shadow King archetype initially, but he becomes yeah. the king, the proper king. Tolkien was fond of this Shadow King redeeming himself in the story. He was mm -hmm. he uses the trope a lot. Yeah, um, and it's a really good one. Who can blame him? Yeah. It's a great trope. And you've got Bilbo, who, of course, uh, steals from the villagers of Lake Town. Now, I made a mistake when I said that the dwarves apparently didn't know Dale was rebuilt. My bad. Actually, Dale has not been rebuilt. That I made a lore hiccup there. So I apologize to everyone uh, for that hiccup. But that said... The, actually, the survivors of the village of the Dale fled to Lake Town and founded Lake Town. And as these, uh, the people of Lake Town actually want to cut later, which I actually think that's fair. It's like they, they, they house they, the dwarves. They house and help the dwarves get back to health, and they arm them. Mm hmm. The uh, elves, they <laughs> just held them prisoner. Yeah. They have no claim. But the thing is, uh, the people of Lake Town have a claim. Although that said, the minute Thranduil turned his army around to help save the dwarves, I think he earned a claim. Yes. Like, everyone should have a cut after, if they're all working together to fight off the monsters. And, but the minute, like, I'm just saying, that's kind of my attitude. Everyone had the right to it, to an extent. And of course, they, uh, uh, well, they arrive in Lake Town page 218. So, one one thing I actually liked was well, when... Well, 221. When, uh, here it is, Bilbo went to break them out, and you had uh, Thorin pretty much was like, that plan is insane! We could die in there. Well, I could always lock you guys back up. All right! Yeah. I also find it funny how uh, a few of them were just utterly sick from uh, being in those uh, barrels and from rolling around in the water. Like yeah, and it makes sense. And, uh, you, although, and apparently Bilbo caught a cold. 
Yes. Because he, he, he slept out in the cold rather than staying warm, which is a little... I feel bad for him. And you know what's the f worst part? What? One of the dwarves never wants to eat apples again. Philly, yes. Philly complains, I was stuck with those apples. Oh, man. Uh, never again. If we do this again, I am nev I don't want to be shoved in with some apples. <laughs> oh, yeah. Like, oh, I can't believe... I think I... Is it Philly? I'm pretty sure I did nail that off the top of my head, but... I want to make damn sure, just as a point to brag. Um, let me see. Uh, no, it was chapter nine. Whoops. Uh, oh, and you get the uh, Song of the Elves, which is a little uh, creepy, but... Um, Oh, whoops. We accidentally jumped into chapter 10 a little. Um, well, we jumped into a little bit of chapter 10, I think. Let me see. Uh, let me see. I'm just checking around here. Oh, yeah, we accidentally got into a bit of chapter 10. Well, we'll cover more of that next time, along with chapter 11 for our next book club episode. Uh, that'll bring us up right up to the doorstep, literal doorstep, of Smaug. Uh, and from there, we'll deal with the entire desolation of Smaug. What is that? That title is terrible. But that's Peter Jackson for you. No imagination, I find it. Anyways. And myth wording. Yeah. Uh, but we'll be dealing with uh, Smaug after that, uh, which I can't wait for that. Smaug I really like as a character. He's a great villain. Mm -hmm. I find he has as much presence as the White Witch in the first book. Yes. Although, it's interesting that he looms over the book, uh, but doesn't appear immediately. Now, this kind of technique is not as well used as, later as with Sauron, who just looms over uh, the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Anyways, uh, do comment, like, uh, share the video, please do. And don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. We're trying to reach a thousand subscribers and we'll publish the first page of a dark fantasy horror novel we've been working on. And we really, really want to get there. So until next time, uh, Take care and stay safe, men and women of the West.